Hi there, this is Barry Marshall and I'm coming to you this morning from the H. Pylori Research Lab in Perth, Western Australia at the University of Western Australia. And my first slide just shows you a photograph of my colleagues who work in the H. Pylori Research Lab and you can find our website at hpylori.com.au and of course I have quite a few uh, interesting websites, helico.com, helicobacter.com and even my own personal website, barryjmarshall.com, which you can find if you do a search at any time. But to wind up the conference for you, uh, I thought I'd like to talk about uh, important issues with Helicobacter pylori right now, uh, which maybe are not addressed in some of the conferences, and then uh, perhaps talk about a little bit about the future, and I'll tell you what I'm doing here uh, uh, at the University of Western Australia. So, uh, firstly, in my next slide, I just make a couple of points about diagnosis. You know, in Western Australia, we use all the available tests. So, you can't say one test is going to suit every person. Uh, we use carbon-14 breath tests. We use the same one as the United States, uh, PI test, it's called. And I developed that in the US when I used to work there in the 1990s. We also use serology. The, the advantage of serology is it's very sensitive, so you can exclude H. pylori if it's negative. And the carbon-14 breath test is very specific. So by combining the two, you have almost 100% accurate diagnosis of H. pylori. Of course, you could use a carbon-13 breath test, and to a lesser degree, not quite as accurate, you could use a stool test as uh, a definite proof of Helicobacter pylori infection. In Western Australia, we recommend that you always follow up your patients after treatment. You will not know how accurate your diagnosis is. You will not know how successful your treatment is unless you follow up all your patients after treatment. And in every country, we find different uh, patterns of antibiotic resistance, so you can't necessarily rely on someone else's data and assume that a certain treatment is going to be, be successful in your area. So I, I encourage you to use a definitive test, proof of eradication with a breath test, a stool test, or if you haven't got those, maybe even endoscopy and biopsy in some pa patients. Don't be trapped into using polymerase chain reaction. I know a lot of people uh, are writing papers about polymerase chain reaction as a diagnosis, uh, but in my opinion, polymerase chain reaction alone is not to be recommended. It seems to produce a lot of false positive results, so it's not properly validated against gold standards such as culture. For treatment, I'd say just remember that most treatment failures are caused by de novo resistance. That's resistance that develops to clarithromycin and metronidazole during the treatment. So although resistance in the population to, say, clarithromycin and macrolides is important, uh, it's, you should be aware that a lot of resistance does develop during the treatment. So after your first treatment, you're going to have to use a different combination of drugs. Um, but there's good news, and we've just published a paper about this, which I'll show you a slide of, that salvage regimens can cure more than 90% of patients. So tell your patients and, and uh, doctors to be, remain enthusiastic after treatment failures because the second or third treatment is still very, very successful. And in Western Australia, in our recent paper, we found nearly 95% cure rate, even in patients who were allergic to penicillin. So uh, we're very optimistic and we tell patients don't be depressed when the treatment fails. So in the next slide, uh, you can see our strategies of treatments. The first one, of course, will be the standard Maastricht treatment, uh, proton pump inhibitor, amoxicillin and metronidazole, or proton pump, uh, amoxicillin and clarithromycin. In Western Australia, we give those for seven days, and the treatment is probably going to be uh, just uh, about a cure rate of 85%. Um, People who are allergic to penicillin, of course, can get PPI, clarithromycin, and metronidazole together, which was uh, Franco Bazzoli's original treatment. However, when patients fail that treatment, well, even without doing uh, culture and sensitivities, you can go on to give a treatment which we call PARC, proton pump inhibitor, amoxicillin, rifabutin, and ciprofloxacin. Now, you could use any quinolone instead of ciprofloxacin. You could use levofloxacin, whichever is least expensive. But if you use a high-dose 
of the proton pump inhibitor and helps all the other antibiotics work. And in our combination or of a kind of a sequential therapy, uh, where we give the amoxicillin and the PPI for 10 days, and we only give the rifabutin and the ciprofloxacin for the last five days of the treatment. And that saves a lot of expense for the patient. And in that treatment, we have a cure rate of about 95%. So it is a quite a good treatment. Of course, if the patient's allergic to penicillin, you're just going to replace the amoxicillin with bismuth. But anyway, have a read of our paper. It's in Elementary Pharmacology and Therapeutics, August 2012. It's called Helicobacter pylori eradication in Western Australia using novel quadruple therapy combinations, and that's treatment results in approximately 300 patients. So what about the future? I've got a few ideas for the future. I so I would like to see people doing more research, especially in South America, uh, because you need novel new treatments for H. pylori, new formulations of old antibiotics. So keep experimenting on, on those different combinations and you'll save your patients a lot of expense and probably come up with some really interesting new treatments. I really think there's still plenty of work to be done evaluating bismuth in combinations with antibiotics. Secondly, uh, I hope that there are some natural products, some uh, foods or herbs that uh, can be used uh, to inhibit H. pylori. And a lot of people are very interested in that and it could be used by itself maybe or it could be used to supplement an antibiotic treatment for H. pylori and I think we're going to see some uh, interesting results in those kinds of studies in the future. And of course there's probiotics. Already a couple of uh, probiotics are on the market around the world to help suppress H. pylori but I would like to see stronger probiotics, enhanced probiotics in the future. Now finally there are perhaps useful adaptations of H. pylori. So in my uh, lab and in my company on deck, I'll show you a slide of them in a second, uh, we are evaluating Helicobacter pylori as a vaccine delivery system. Uh, secondly, there's evidence that H. pylori can be used for immunomodulation, and I, I hope to have some publications from my lab on that area very soon. And finally, you, theoretically, you could deliver uh, small amounts of peptides, hormones and things, via H. pylori into the gut, maybe cytokines, uh, and maybe drugs uh, into the portal venous system uh, through the gut wall. So finally, I'll just show you uh, the idea that we're working on in my in, uh, research company called On Deck Biologic Delivery Systems. And this is the concept, what if H. pylori, live H. pylori, could be given to people to carry a vaccine? And people could be vaccinated with a single dose of H. pylori and carry uh, a vaccination strain in their gut for days, weeks, months, or even permanently, depending on which strain you chose. And there is evidence that a lot of H. pylori strains do not cause very many symptoms by themselves. So it could be useful to carry something else into the body and potentially uh, vaccines for the common things such as tetanus, rubella, uh, could be used, the new pandemics, SARS, uh, bird flu, and then maybe the very difficult vaccinations could even be attempted uh, well, I guess we could dream of a vaccine for malaria, hepatitis C, HIV, and even tuberculosis carried into the body uh, by H. pylori. So I hope we'll see those developments over the next 20 or 30 years and that you can help me uh, on this journey. Thank you.